Hello, welcome to a special post-election edition of CUNY Citizenship Now's Facebook Live series. Today's broadcast is sponsored by the New York State Office of New Americans Liberty Defense Project and funding for CUNY Citizenship Now's legal services is possible thanks to the New York City Council. I am Sean Ramon from CUNY Citizenship Now. If you would like to make an appointment to speak to one of our attorneys, please call us at 646-664-9400. Again, 646-664-9400, or you can reach us by text at 929-334-3784 or by email at citizenshipnowinfo at cuny.edu. Our featured speaker today is a widely recognized authority on citizenship and immigration law. His columns on immigration law appear every Monday in the New York Daily News and in Aldea Dallas. He serves as director of CUNY Citizenship Now, CUNY's Free Citizenship and Immigration Service Project, and is also a professor at CUNY's Baruch College. We are pleased to welcome Alan Wernick. Thank you, Sean. Thank you for that great introduction. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank uh, Sofia Carreño, uh, our communications coordinator, our deputy director, Monique Francis, and all the staff of CUNY Citizenship Now, who through these difficult times has every day uh, providing free services to uh, the immigrant community in New York and the surrounding area. So thanks again. Thanks so much, Alan. And you know what? And can't wait to see all those wonderful people. Can't wait to see you again. Uh, looking forward to that. Yeah, it's very... It's, uh, it's difficult not seeing all the wonderful staff of CUNY Citizenship now and seeing uh, the, those immigrants that we help face to face in our community events and in our offices. Uh, but we'll weather this, it will pass. And in the meantime, uh, we continue, like I said, every day to help uh, people uh, on the path to uh, US citizenship. All right, thanks. Uh, before we get started, uh, Professor Wernick will answer some of your questions in a Q&A session following today's talk. So please go ahead and ask your questions in the comments section, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. So, so Alan, before we get into specifics, with Congress still divided, how hopeful are you that President Biden will be able to undo the damage of the last four years with or without Congress? Well, I think uh, the pre uh, a new president will be able to do a lot to improve the lives of the of immigrants in the United States, but he will not be able to accomplish everything uh, based on uh, what we see from the uh, con from Congress uh, being so divided. It's important for listeners, uh, those who are following this uh, Facebook Live to understand that there are two ways that the United States government uh, promulgates or puts into practice immigration policy. One is through the Congress. Congress makes the laws and the executive branch, which is led by our president, uh, enforces those laws. But the immigration practices day to day in the rules and regulations are made by the executive branch, which is led by our president through the Department of Homeland Security. And um, as long as those regulations and policies don't contradict the laws passed by Congress or the US Constitution, um, then the president has broad leeway to, to do many things uh, across our country, including our deportation policies, our, po our border policies, and uh, many of our uh, programs. Let's take a look at DACA, for example. And DACA was a program that was created administratively by the Obama administration. And um, in February 2017, President Trump tried to end that program. Now, the way he did it was not proper. He did not follow the appropriate rules and rules for changing uh, a, a policy like that. And the Supreme Court found that and, and ordered that the uh, Trump administration go back to the original Obama plan. They failed to do that. Instead, they decided that uh, individuals with DACA or who had DACA could apply for one year uh, in, in that status as opposed to the two years under Obama. And he 
uh, limited who could travel with DACA. And he decided that nobody who never had DACA could apply for it again. I expect that on day one of the Trump, of the, of a Biden administration, we're going to see DACA fully restored. Now that may happen even before January 20th when Biden takes office because the courts um, are looking at uh, whether or not uh, uh, Trump is uh, most recent policies um, are appropriate. Um, and we should know in, in a couple of weeks, uh, perhaps by uh, early December, whether or not DACA will be restored before Biden takes office. But certainly when Biden takes office, that uh, we expect DACA to be, re uh, to be reinstated. And that will be particularly valuable to anyone who turned 15, because that's the age you have to be to apply for DACA. So people who turned uh, 15 uh, after um, uh, February 2017, when uh, uh, Trump ended the program, will be able to apply. And that's going to benefit uh, you know, maybe 100,000 or more uh, individuals. Uh, on the other hand, on the legislative side, of course, we're still waiting to see whether the Democrats are going to control the Senate. They already control the House of Representatives. Uh, we'll know after the uh, um, uh, election in Georgia. But I'm concerned that even if the Democrats do control the Senate, it may be difficult, especially in a time of high unemployment, um, to pass legislation that provides uh, broader relief for undocumented immigrants, such as a path to citizenship for the, unle uh, for the 11 million undocumented immigrants. However, I'm very optimistic that Congress will path, uh, pass uh, and create a path to citizenship for those with DACA, because that's a very popular program. It may take a year or so, uh, but I'm optimistic that sometime during the Biden administration, Congress will pass some relief undocumented immigrants, but I don't expect to happen, uh, that to happen during the first year. Of course, we're going to fight for that. We're going to ask for that. We're going to demand that. But, you know, I have to answer the questions as they are asked to me, and I have to perhaps bring the bad news that I don't see it happening. Whoops, sorry about that, uh, in the first year of the Biden administration. Well, Whoops. really, if, little, if, have, if, yeah, go ahead. Really, if President Biden can deliver that, even if it's not in the first year, as you know, back in 2012, uh, DACA itself was created when President Obama couldn't get Congress to pass a law to protect the Dreamers. So, if Biden can deliver that uh, uh, permanent solution for DACA recipients, as you say, it would be a tremendous victory. Um, and, and let me just say, he also might he also might uh, try to uh, institute other relief such as the DAPA program, which is uh, mm -hmm. for the parents of people who are U.S. citizens and permanent residents who are, un who, who are undocumented. And if he, he may be able to, based on what the Supreme Court decided, it, it appears that he could do that. Uh, Obama tried, it was stopped by the courts, but I think there's a good chance that he, he will uh, engage and uh, put forward executive orders uh, such as that, providing some kind of protection for those individuals. Also, he has said that he will suspend deportation uh, for uh, the first 100 days to, to revamp our, our program and to revisit our policies towards uh, uh, undocumented immigrants in the United States. So I th he can do really a tremendous amount. And there, there are many, many other things. Perhaps we'll get to them uh, in the course of this discussion. All right, thank you so much. I want to switch gears in a little bit now to uh, USCIS's recent announcement that actually just last week that immigrants seeking to become US citizens will now be required to answer even more questions about American history and politics as part of a revised exam. Now, um, your thoughts on the new exam and particularly its timing, it certainly looks tougher. Well, you know, the Trump administration at every step has done everything it can to keep people from becoming U.S. citizens. You know, when he ran for office, he said he was mainly concerned about undocumented immigrants. But it's clear that he's done everything he can to keep people from getting green cards, from becoming permanent residents, but also to keep people from becoming U.S. citizens. And I think this new exam is just another part of that effort. The exam is uh, much harder. Um, it has... Uh, 128 questions as opposed to the current 100. It's going to require that individuals 
um, answer uh, 12 of 20 questions instead of six out of 10, which is the current rule. It only applies to applications that are received by USCIS December 1st or after. So if you want to take the test under the current rules, you need to get your applications into USCIS by the, uh, by the end of November. So there is time to do that. If you want to apply for citizenship, please call us, uh, uh, please call CUNY Citizenship now and we can help you with your application. Let's get those applications in by December 30th. Now, people, many people have asked me whether the Obama, uh, the uh, Biden administration, pardon me, uh, is going to be able to reverse that and go back to the old test, maybe. I'm not sure that they certainly can. I'm not sure that they will. They haven't commented on that yet. Um, they may want to wait a little bit and put some other programs in first, but I'm optimistic that they will at some point revisit the exam um, because it's, you know, some of the questions, by the way, are just wrong, you know, um, uh, you know, and some of the answers are way more complex than they need to be. It's basically a memorization test. Well, certainly, I couldn't answer all of the questions properly. I went through them and, you know, I've mm -hmm. been around this for a long time. I was a politi political science major in college. I couldn't answer all the questions. Uh, but um, you know, if you memorize the answers, you can answer the questions. I don't think the ability to memorize should, is really what we want from our uh, US, new U.S. citizens. So I'm optimistic that that, uh, that will be changed. But definitely a reminder, get your naturalization applications in. By November 30th, you have to have five years permanent residence, three years if you've been married to and living with a U.S. citizen while a permanent resident for three years. And some people, in, if you've been in the military, you may be able to apply after only one year's permanent residence. All right, thanks, Alan. Just wanna give out our numbers again, you know, to speak to one of our attorneys, please give us a call at 646-664-9400, or you can also text us at 929-334-3784 and reach us by email at CUNY Citizenship Now at, uh, I'm sorry, CUNY, uh, Citizenship Info at CUNY.edu, my apologies. Also, if you want to, um, if you have a question for Professor Warnick, uh, Warnick, go ahead and ask it in the comments. Uh, so I want to, um, Alan, I'd like to switch to fee waivers and, and the increased fees right now. You know, very recently, USCIS wanted to raise application fees, most notably for the citizenship application and also eliminate the fee waiver. But the court stepped in at the last minute and stopped this. Uh, what can we expect after the inauguration on fees and fee waivers? Well, as you know, Sean, um, the courts have blocked that effort to raise the fees and end fee waivers. Mm -hmm. So those waivers are still in place. That's particularly important for people applying for U.S. citizenship or to renew your green cards. If you file your application now and you are uh, receiving some form of uh, public benefit, or you have an, an inability to pay for some other reason, um, you may be able to uh, get a fee waiver and those rules are in place. And the older, lower fees um, before the Trump tried to raise them are also still in place. I expect, that, uh, I expect that the government will end its opposition to those lawsuits. Um, and I expect those uh, uh, fees to remain low and the fee rate waivers to remain in place. Now that doesn't mean there's not gonna be fee increases. I, I anticipate because of the situation, financial situation that our country has got in, that sometime under the Biden administration, there will be some form of a fee increase. Perhaps it won't be as large as uh, proposed by Trump. I expect fee waivers to remain in place because I think it's generally understood that uh, your financial situation should not be a basis for denying you US citizenship. All right, thank you. Um, so Alan, Trump used COVID-19 uh, to essentially suspend entry into the United States by certain uh, immigrant visa applicants to, to, uh, to protect the US labor market during this recovery. Is, is changing this gonna be a priority for President Biden? I think it will. Um, just to clarify what the president rules are between now um, until Jan January 1st, unless Trump e extends it, which I believe he will, uh, immigrant uh, visas are not being issued. 
uh, except for the spouses and unmarried children of United States citizens. As a practical matter, however, the consulates are, are either closed and the ones that are open um, are opening very slowly and are very limited in who uh, is getting appointments. There are people getting immigrant visa appointments uh, if you are the spouse uh, or unmarried child of a U.S. citizen, um, but uh, and that could be extended until, uh, and that is likely to be extended until January 20th. I expect um, President Biden to end that right away. There's no reason for it, but again, it doesn't mean that immediately the consuls are going to start issuing visas. I think that's a separate concern. Mm -hmm. I think that uh, um, it's not just about people coming to the United States. I think the uh, Biden administration is going to end the Muslim ban, which bans people from certain countries from coming to the United States. I think it's going to end these rules uh, limiting who can get green cards, including employment-based applicants um, and all family-based applicants. But I think there's a concern about the consulates themselves. You know, they are operating the same limitations that USCIS in the United States, that's the immigration service here. Um, you know, our, I just learned that New York City schools, just as an example, are gonna be closed tomorrow. So there are concerns about the health and safety of both the applicants and the workers in the consulates. So that's gonna be a relatively slow process. But as a matter of regulation, as a matter of policy, I think those rules are going to end very quickly um, as soon as Biden becomes president. All right, which, thanks, is very, which is very good news. You know, the, yeah. the, mm -hmm. it's it's unfortunate that you know that the way, as I explained in the in the beginning of this presentation, um, there's a tremendous amount of power that's in the executive branch. That's the president and the USCIS, the Immigration Service in the United States the border patrol, uh, the uh, consulates are all under the executive branch. So they have the executive branch, that's the president Trump has a lot of power to slow down the process of people getting their, mm -hmm. their just benefits. And hopefully Biden is gonna open that up. All right, Alan, we have a few questions coming in. I just wanna remind everybody to please go ahead. And if you have a question, please, insert them into the comments here. We will get to those questions right after our discussion. Now, Alan, speaking about immigrant visas uh, and those seeking uh, not only visas, but adjustment of status here in the United States, you wrote in your column that Trump's public charge rule made it very difficult for new immigrants to prove they won't be a public charge. Um, what's the future there? Well, the, the uh, despite challenges in the courts, the President Trump's public charge rules in place. And it has, mm -hmm. a, has a number of aspects of it, parts of it that make it very, very difficult. And it's estimated that about half the people who, qual who otherwise qualify for permanent residence can't pass that public charge test. Now, scholars seem to disagree, experts seem to disagree whether uh, it's going to require a new, a new regulative process, which could take uh, 30 to 90 days uh, once Biden becomes uh, president to end that. And I think he'll want to do that. Or it's possible, some people believe, that um, the, if the Biden administration just orders the Justice Department to stop its opposition to the various lawsuits that have challenged uh, the, the, public, the Trump public charge rule, We'll do that, we'll end it. I'm sort of in the camp that says that um, uh, just right away on January 20th, uh, Biden can uh, uh, order the Justice Department to end its opposition and the courts uh, will be compelled to rule in favor of the plaintiffs. But I'm, you know, I'm, I may be wrong about that, we'll have to see. Uh, certainly there are going to be uh, efforts by people who are restrictionists, who are anti-immigrant to keep those rules in place. But certainly I expect that rule to end within 30 to 90 days of um, Biden becoming president. So what I would do if I was considering applying for permanent residence, first of all, if you have a very strong financials and an immigration law expert can uh, evaluate that for you, certainly we can do that at CUNY Citizenship now. You should go ahead and file your application now. File the I-944 form, which is the very lengthy and complicated form to show that you're not going to need public benefits once you become a, a green card holder, go ahead and file. Um, if you were concerned that perhaps your case is weaker 
but you might qualify under a better rule, then I would wait to see what happens on January 20th um, and then consult uh, uh, again with an immigration law expert uh, who can tell you whether or not you're going to qualify. Because there's no sense filing an application. The filing fees are very high uh, and losing that money because your application is denied. And if you have a close case, I would say it depends on whether you, whether you can afford losing that filing fee. If you have a close case and you can afford the losing the, the thousands of dollars that you will lose, I would say go ahead and file. All right, thank you. You know, to speak to one of our attorneys at CUNY Citizenship Now, please call us at 646-664-9400, or you can text us at 929-334-3784. Again, the email is citizenshipnowinfo at cuny.edu. Again, Sean, Sean, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, Sean, I think it's a good time for me to do what you did at the beginning to thank uh, you know, our, our financial sponsors, you know, first the City University of New York. There is no immigration law service program in the nation that comes anywhere close to being as robust and broad as that provided by CUNY Citizenship Now, first to, for our students, faculty and staff, but also to the community at large. And that's thanks to the generosity and farsightedness of the City University of New York. A shout out to our Chancellor, uh, Felix uh, Matos, to our, uh, the person we report to, Vice Chancellor Maite Junco, and all of the leadership in the Board of Trustees of the City University of New York. Of course, a shout out to the Office of New Americans under uh, Governor Cuomo, who've been so generous, um, and the, especially to the City Council uh, of the City of New York, who have, uh, funds our operation, of course, to the great staff. I mean, we, with all due respect to all the organizations out there, I think we have the most committed and, uh, and, and knowledgeable staff of any organization of its type. Um, and I'm very proud of uh, Sean, you and all of our staff and the great uh, legal work that you all do. Thanks, and, and thanks also to you uh, for being our greatest cheerleader. Thank you so much. Um, I want to uh, get back to the questions. Um, sure. um, switch, our, switch gears a little bit, talk about our what's going on at the borders with refugee admissions and asylum. Um, we know with Trump setting uh, refugee caps at really a historic low, right? And, and you know, the awful remain in Mexico policy and the, and the family separation really seems like uh, he tried to uh, dismantle uh, the asylum system, Alan. How, uh, how do we untangle this? How does President well, Biden do it? Let's start just first talking about refugees. You know, refugees are sent, uh, are decided by uh, the president of the United States. Uh, he set a cap of 15,000, actually about, only about eight to 10,000 people uh, a year coming in under that program. I expect, uh, you know, President Biden to raise that to 125,000. Um, that's a more reasonable number if, if, consistent with past practices. Um, of course, with the Muslim ban lifted, that means that people around the world who are refugees can be able to come into the United States. I remind our listeners that the process to become a refugee is not an easy process. You do have to show that you're going to be persecuted uh, in your country, that you have been persecuted or will be persecuted in your country because of your race, your religion, your political opinion, uh, your nationality, or a member in a particular social group. You have to go through a very careful vetting process uh, regarding your health, regarding your any possible criminal record, um, whether you you know you're you have been associated with any terrorist organization. So it is not an easy process, but it's certainly one. Um, we've done fairly that a genuine refugee can pass. Um, I expect, uh, and I think that that is likely to happen quite quickly. And also that's very important to the various organizations that help refugees because uh, those organizations that do such a great job of helping people get jobs when they come here, helping people get res resettled, helping people find apartments, helping people abroad process the refugee process. You know, they're all hurting because without the refugee processing, they don't get the funds from the federal government to help them do that. So that's gonna, that's gonna be great because those are terrific organizations. In terms of the border, um, I expect all of those restrictionist policies, you know, the remain in Mexico policy, the policy that takes away people's right um, to a fair hearing. I think the policy that Trump is trying to implement to deport people within the United States who have been here less than two years without a hearing. I expect all those pro programs to end. 
the border programs are going to take a little bit of time. Um, I don't think it's going to be something that can be done, uh, you know, overnight. It's just too complex, involves too many people, involves a lot of resources. But I expect in the first six months to a year um, of the Biden administration, those policies will be fixed. I think the program of trying to deport people from the interior of the United States who have been here um, uh, without a, deport people without a hearing, who are undocumented, who have been here less than two years, I think that program will end on day one. It's something that can be done with a phone call. So um, I expect we're, we're going to return to a more fair uh, immigration policy. Now, that doesn't mean that if you're undocumented, you're not going to be deported. I expect the Biden administration to go back to the, uh, to the Obama, administrative, uh, Obama approach, which is to allow people to stay here um, with, with some protection. And uh, if they have not, if they do not have a criminal record or an outstanding order of deportation um, and to make a, the, the uh, Biden administration will make a priority of deporting people who have criminal records and outstanding deportation orders. If you are here uh, un undocumented, um, you should get a consultation with an, an immigration law expert to make sure that you have not uh, uh, missed um, any opportunities that might be available to you to get permanent residence. All right, thank you. You know, you mentioned the Muslim travel ban before, the incoming administration signaled that it intends to, you know, rescind the travel and immigration restrictions on the 13 countries, mostly African or predominantly Muslim countries. Uh, did you mention how long, uh, when this can be done? I think it can be done right away. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. I think it's, it, you know, it was put in place by executive order. I think it can be ended by executive order. I expect that to happen on day one of the Biden administration. Um, and isn't that going to be grand? You know, what, a, what an embarrassment it is to people in the world that our country is, you know, um, denying people based on their religious beliefs from coming to the United States. So, of course, the Trump administration, that's not, that's not the basis of the ban, but we all know that it is. Now, uh, on deportations, and we have one question about uh, those who are undocumented, I, and I want to tie it into this sure. uh, final final question on deportation. You know, uh, you talked about the 100-day freeze on uh, deportations, um, you know, while they work out new guidance on who can be arrested by immigration agents. That sounds like a very bold move, 100-day freeze. Um, uh, how will this go over politically? What do you think? Well, I don't think it's going to make some people happy. And of course, we don't know whether it's going to apply to everybody. You know, we haven't seen the, you know, the exact language, mm -hmm. um, you know, until, until it happens, we don't know if it's going to happen. But, you know, I think most Americans don't want to see the deportation of people without criminal records. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the, there's no reason for it. Um, we have undocumented people who are our neighbors who are going to whose children are going to school with our children who are helping coach the local soccer team. And I just mentioned soccer because it's not as popular in the United States as in most of the sending countries. So we do have a lot of uh, um, soccer teams, the youth soccer teams that are being coached by undocumented immigrants. So I, I think it's not gonna be so unpopular. Um, it's gonna be unpopular with some, some uh, people. Um, but, you know, undocumented immigrants are not authorized to work in the United States, so they're not really taking jobs away from Americans. I mean, they may be selling flowers in the corner or, or operating in, in, in the back of some restaurants and very unpopular jobs, certainly in the, ag in, in the agricultural industry, in those very difficult jobs, we still have a lot of undocumented immigrants working in the fields. I'm not sure it's going to be as unpopular as some people think. I mean, right. like I said, there's going to be a sector that's going to make a big deal about it. But, you know, when Trump started his, his presidency saying these are murderers and rapists, I think most Americans know that that's not true. And I think most Americans are not going to want to see their neighbors deported. All right. Thanks, Alan. OK, one last time with our numbers before we take some questions uh, to make an appointment to speak to our legal staff about your immigration matter. Please call us at 646-664-9400. You can reach us by text at 929 three three four three seven eight four or by email at cuny i'm sorry i always do that at citizenship now info at cuny.edu all right on to the questions alan we did get a question about 
Is there, and this is the question, is there any hope for undocumented people, I presume uh, in, in terms of long-term solution, perhaps some kind of amnesty program? Yeah, I think there's hope. I, I do think there's hope. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's unlikely that in the first year of the Biden administration, while we're still in this COVID crisis, I think we're going to have to resolve that problem first. You know, one of the things that um, studies have found is that um, undocumented immigrants don't take jobs away from uh, U.S. workers. And even newly made immigrants don't take jobs away. In fact, we're going to need immigrants. I mean, as Social Security, uh, as, as the, my generation uh, starts going on Social Security, not that I'm that old, but um, I'd like, well, at least like to think I'm not that old. Um, as my generation, though, goes on Social Security, you know, the baby boomers, um, we're going to need young workers paying into it. And there just aren't enough of them without immigrants. So I think that we're going to see uh, a legalization program that was called under the uh, Republican Reagan administration. Um, I think we're going to see something like that. Um, but I don't think it's going to be possible in the first year. Now, some people may, you know, throw a stone at me about that, but, you know, it's not, I'm just say, saying it how I see it. It's not impossible. But the problem is when we have this COVID crisis and there are no jobs and there's such high unemployment and people are very concerned about whether they're going to be able to get a job, I think it's going to be very difficult to get enough U.S. senators uh, to pass mm -hmm. a path. You remember under the uh, both under the Bush and Obama administrations, there were efforts to pass um, a path to citizenship for undocumented immigrants. And even uh, under Obama, when the Democrats co controlled both the House and the Senate, uh, he was unable to get a path to citizenship passed for undocumented immigrants. So I just don't see mm -hmm. it happening in the first year. But I think maybe in the second year of the Biden administration, and if certainly if, the, if he does well in ending the COVID crisis, which I think he'll be able to do, we may be able to see it. All right, great. I know we touched on DACA earlier in the questions. There is one question about DACA here. I'd like to get answered uh, by you, Alan. If someone never applied for DACA before, uh, can they apply uh, 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 now uh, or after Biden takes office? Well, um, the federal district court last week based on a prior Supreme Court decision, ruled that it, the way that the government has treated the DACA program is unlawful. And that the original Obama order, which would allow people who never had DACA, should be in place. Now, just this morning, there was a hearing in federal district court, and there was an agreement that in the next couple of weeks, there's going to have to be a, a decision on how that federal court decision is implemented uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Until that time, I don't believe that USCIS will accept applications from individuals who never had DACA. But I'm very optimistic that by the first end of the first week of December, that the court will order the federal government to accept new DACA applications. So I'm expecting that in December, individuals who never had DACA but who qualify under the rules for DACA. And you can learn about what the rules are at our website, uh, cuny.edu slash citizenship now, um, that the government will start accepting applications. So if you have, if you qualify for DACA, but never filed, what you should be doing is gathering your documentation to show that you entered the United States before the age of 16 and that you meet the other requirements. And you're going to have to show continuing residence in the United States um, under the rules of uh, DACA. So take a look at what the rules are. Start putting your, doc your documentation together. Maybe take a look at the form, fill out a draft of it. And then once, um, once uh, the, we're clear that you're going to be able to file CUNY citizenship now, it's going to make a special extra effort to help people get their applications in quickly so that they can get employment authorization so that they can travel outside of the United States. All right, thanks, Alan. You know, we're, we're over time now. That's all the time we have for today. Uh, we're thrilled you can join us. Uh, if we didn't get to your question, we will try our best to answer it offline. In the comments, we will 
see you all again with our next Facebook Live session after the holidays. We wish you all health and happiness. Again, Alan, thank you for your time. Any last words? I just want to say thanks, Sean, and, and do keep up with our Facebook Live sec uh, sessions. Mm -hmm. I've been following them. I think they're excellent. Um, and uh, I apologize for a little technical problem there. Uh, it's a little difficult operating, uh, you know, from home. Um, but Sean, you did a great job. Uh, thanks again to all the staff at CUNY Citizenship Now that put this together. Um, and by the way, you can uh, follow me um, on Twitter at A Wernick at A W E R N I C K. Do look for my columns in the uh, New York Daily News every Monday. And until we meet again, um, I look forward and I look forward to doing that. And again, thanks, Sean. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. Goodbye, everyone.